Before 1952, open heart surgery was an impossible dream. The outer wall of the living human heart was a barrier, impenetrable to the surgeon's knife. We see here the famous uh, English painting of, uh, by Sir Luke Fields of the uh, physician beside the bed of a dying child. If that child was dying of an intracardiac malformation 40 years ago, this physician had little more to offer than prayer. Now, with the heart-lung machine, correction is routine and inevitable. This film recounts the beginnings of open-heart surgery. Excerpts from original film footage document four corrective procedures as they were first performed at the University of Minnesota Hospital. Each was a milestone that led open-heart surgery to what it is today. At times, the frustration uh, uh, developed almost to the point we were thinking of giving up, but uh, after further thought and perhaps a good night's sleep, uh, we came back with fresh ideas and uh, persistence uh, usually led to uh, satisfactory uh, a solution and even breakthroughs. Today, open heart surgery is regarded as one of the major medical advances of the 20th century. Performed effortlessly and at low risk to patients of all ages, neonates to octogenarians. Over 2,000 open heart corrective procedures are now done around the world each day. In 1951, open heart surgery became possible because of developments at the University of Minnesota's Department of Surgery a relatively unknown medical center at the time. Yet even then, Minnesota had some unique facilities, including the Variety Club Heart Hospital. On July 1st, 1951, the Variety Club Heart Hospital opened its 80-bed facility exclusively dedicated to heart patients, the first of its kind in the world. With this facility, physicians were challenged to devise and improve techniques to treat heart disease. Owen H. Wangenstein, as chairman of the Department of Surgery, added enormously to this environment. Although not a cardiac surgeon, Dr. Wangenstein was a visionary surgeon. He trained many returning World War II veteran surgeons in a method that emphasized knowing the basic sciences and gaining insights through research. He encouraged young surgeons to go forward on the knowledge and judgment produced by their own research. From this environment, major accomplishments would soon burst forth. The first on September 2nd, 1952. Dr. F. John Lewis successfully closed an atrial secundum defect in a five-year-old Minneapolis girl under direct vision using inflow stasis and moderate total body hypothermia. Stimulated by the 1950 report of Toronto doctor William Bigelow and prepared by extensive experimental work in dogs, Dr. Lewis's first human operation went smoothly, lasting 58 minutes. The patient made an uneventful recovery and was discharged on the 11th post-operative day. Post-op cardiac catheterization showed complete closure of the defect. The patient is now 40 years post-surgery, lives a normal life, and is the mother of two normal children. The uh, ability to close these uh, atrial defects under direct vision using inflow stasis and hypothermia was a dramatic success and word spread rapidly throughout the medical world. This is original footage of an open heart procedure which took place one month later in October 1952. The superior and inferior vena cava are encircled with tapes. The aorta is also circled with tape to control air embolism. The patient, a sickly seven-year-old girl, is anesthetized and wrapped in a cooling blanket. Refrigerant circulates through the blanket until rectal temperature reaches 28 degrees centigrade. The cooling blanket is then removed. The patient is placed in a lateral position and the heart and great vessels are exposed through a right thoracotomy. The cavi are occluded, the right atrium is open, and the defect is picked up with the forceps. Surgeons have learned that these atrial septal defects can be complicated in their anatomy. This defect is centrally located. 
To close, a half purse string stitch is placed at each end of the defect with a running stitch of 3-0 silk. Before the last stitches are placed, a plastic catheter is introduced into the left atrium. The chamber is rapidly filled with 5% glucose to displace air as the aorta is occluded. The heart continues to beat slowly in this case. In others, ventricular fibrillation may occur, but these moderately hypothermic hearts defibrillate with ease. The closure is inspected and an additional silk stitch is placed. The right atrium is closed with a tangential clamp while the atriotomy is sutured. The cavi are released, restoring the patient's own circulation and the heart takes over on its own. With the chest wall closed, the patient is immersed in a bath of water about 114 degrees Fahrenheit to warm her. In 35 minutes, her rectal temperature reaches 36 degrees centigrade and she is removed from the practical, if primitive, Sears Roebuck cattle watering tank. This technique of hypothermia proved excellent with a low risk for atrial septal defects and certain congenital lesions of the pulmonary and aortic valves. But when this tame technique was extended to the more complicated defects in the lower chambers, uh, ventricular septal defects or uh, the ostium primum type of lesions, universal failure ensued. In April 1951, Dr. Clarence Dennis and colleagues at the University of Minnesota first used a pump oxygenator for total cardiopulmonary bypass to permit intracardiac surgery. Two patients were operated on that month. Both died of complications that continued to plague cardiac surgeons for years. From 1951 through 1954, the literature reported 18 open heart operations by extracorporeal circulation performed at various centers around the world. Early death was uniform with one exception, an atrial septal defect operated on by Dr. John Gibbon in May 1953. Dr. John Gibbon had been one of the pioneers in uh, the development of open heart surgery and he was started his work in 1937 in the experimental laboratory uh, developing a heart-lung machine to uh, perform intracardiac surgery. And his success in 1953 was well received by the medical profession but did not uh, generate much enthusiasm at the time for several reasons, I believe. One is that essentially it was reduplication of the work that Dr. Lewis had started with hypothermia and uh, several other centers had taken up Dr. Lewis's method by that time and were closing these atrial septal defects regularly with a low risk and a high degree of success. Perhaps the more uh, depressing problem uh, that Gibbon had is that he was not able to repeat his one success in five additional attempts and he personally became so discouraged by these failures that uh, he walked out of the operating room after the last case and said that he would never perform another open heart operation. His discouragement, along with failures worldwide, added to the prevalent gloom about the future of open heart surgery to treat complex human lesions. All reported attempts at clinical open heart surgery by extracorporeal circulation shared a common scenario. Good results with an acceptable survival in the experimental animals, but universal failure when the same apparatus and same techniques were applied to humans. With seemingly impeccable logic, many of the most experienced investigators concluded that the problems were not with the heart-lung machine or the techniques. The uh, heart had incisions into the wall and cutting and stitching inside so that we could not anticipate a heart like that ravaged by disease before the operation could take over promptly after the operation. The sick human heart theory caused wide discouragement on the future of open heart surgery until a pump could be devised to support the heart during its five to 10 day recovery period. 
Into this dark atmosphere in 1954, Dr. Lilyhigh and colleagues clinically introduced extracorporeal circulation by cross-circulation. This radical approach to extracorporeal perfusion provided some open-heart experience using animals. As these experiments progressed, it became apparent that dogs undergoing a 30-minute open-heart perfusion and utilizing low-flow cross-circulation not only survived at a far higher percent, but recovered much more rapidly than earlier dogs undergoing a similar period of high-flow pump oxygenator perfusions. These differences were truly astonishing, and for the first time, we realized that this might be the simple, effective clinical method for intracardiac surgery that we had been searching for. Clinical cross-circulation for intracardiac operations was an immense departure from established surgical practice. Taking a normal human being to the operating room to provide a donor circulation was considered unacceptable and even immoral by some critics. However, the heart surgeons at the University of Minnesota hospitals suspected that total body perfusion with open cardiotomy caused massive physiological disturbances. Temporary placental circulation could minimize or even correct these disturbances. Centers around the world working on heart-lung bypass were having no success. So the Minnesota heart surgeons decided to go ahead with cross-circulation technique even though critics pointed out that this was the first operation in medical history with the potential for, as they said, a 200% mortality. On March 26, 1954, the first clinical attempt was made to close a ventricular septal defect using cross-circulation. The 12-month-old patient had been hospitalized since birth with repeated episodes of heart failure and pneumonia. With the uh, successes of cross-circulation, in correcting these malformations, obviously the sick human heart theory or belief was refuted practically overnight. This uh, next patient seen in this uh, film made in 1954 is a 20-month-old infant who had been uh, referred for operation because of poor growth, frequent episodes of heart failure and uh, elevated pressure in his pulmonary artery, which was very ominous. That was diagnosed by heart catheterization. And the onset of cyanotic uh, episodes associated with heart failure. The cardiologist concluded that the infant boy's prognosis was very poor without corrective surgery. X-rays showed marked cardiac enlargement of both right and left ventricles. The pulmonary vessels are prominent the pulmonary artery segment is enlarged, as is the left atrium, all typical of ventricular septal defect. Catheters were placed from the right atrium into the superior and inferior vena cavi. The cavi are encircled with tapes along with the root of the aorta. The aortic tape is connected to a sliding Rommel-type tourniquet to control air embolism and to give brief periods of ischemic arrest when needed for exposure. The aorta is cannulated with a catheter inserted through a subclavian arteriotomy. The pump to control the interchange is placed between patient and donor. The donor is usually a parent who must have the same blood type, which is always true in one of the parents. Donor cannulations are through a small opening in the saphenous vein with the tip of the catheter into the vena cava and through a femoral arteriotomy with the tip of the catheter into the aorta. The hookup usually includes a venous reservoir for smooth flow. In this cross-circulation operation, the donor is on the right, the patient is on the left. Dr. Lilyhigh and his colleagues performed all these cross-circulation operations at normal thermia. Headlight use became routine after the first operation. Doctors Morley Cohen and Herbert Warden, surgical residents at the time, managed the donor during all these procedures. The chest was opened by transverse sternotomy. Cannulations were completed, cavi were occluded, and then the right ventricular cavity is opened. Note the very thick right ventricular muscle due to the hypertrophy. From this view, the 20-month-old patient is flat on his back, his head to your left, feet to your right, with the right atrium in the foreground. Using a forceps, Dr. Lilyhigh picks up the edge of this large ventricular septal defect in the membranous area of the septum. 
Closure is achieved with a half purse string stitch at either end of the defect and interrupted silk sutures between. Once all sutures are placed, the left atrium and left ventricle are filled rapidly with 5% glucose to displace the air as the stitches are tied. The heart beats without any evidence of heart block. Closure of the right ventriculotomy is carefully done with a full thickness 3-0 stitch. The cable occlusions are released and the patient is returned to his own circulation. Eight stitches close this ventricular defect. The patient had a pump bypass interval of 12 minutes. Total body flow was 300 cc's per minute, equal to 30 cc's per minute per kilogram of body weight. Palpation confirms the absence of any palpable thrill in the pulmonary artery segment. The infant's mother was the donor. The patient is seen here 10 days postoperatively, a bit subdued, but very viable. The parents of all these patients were told of the value of returning for postoperative heart catheterization in 6 to 12 months. Better than 90% of these patients complied. 20 years after his open heart surgery, this patient successfully enlisted in the Marines without telling his examiners about his surgery and served honorably in Vietnam. Of the 45 cross-circulation operations, 27 were for closure of ventricular septal defect. 19 survived to leave the hospital and only two of these had died by the 30-year follow-up examinations. Both had closed defects but developed progressive pulmonary hypertension. Of the eight hospital deaths, six were infants under two years old. Among all the survivors, 11 patients were under two years old, 10 were under one year, and four patients were under six months of age. The fact that uh, we connected temporarily the patient circulation to the mother or father circulation provided a method for correcting the many abnormalities in the blood of these sick patients, abnormalities that we knew nothing about at that time and obviously could not measure. And uh, temporarily uh, restoring or instituting a placental type circulation uh, had immense benefits for these patients and that's why they were so successful uh, as compared with the attempts made previously with the heart-lung machine. Prior to the world's authorities on extracorporeal circulation agreed that blood could not be arterialized by a bubble oxygenator. In early 1955, and based on their laboratory research, DeWall and Lillehive began clinical use of a simple yet effective disposable bubble oxygenator. The bubble oxygenator drew strong criticism, as some charged that patients' brains were being destroyed. The Minnesota group reported, and others soon confirmed, that these patients were being carefully and intensively studied. Screening tests run by neurologists detected no cerebral function abnormalities. A third milestone operation depicts using the disposable bubble oxygenator. In 1955, this seven-year-old girl was carried into the heart hospital by her parents for intracardiac correction of the tetralogy of Fallot defects. Before corrective surgery, the girl is severely incapacitated by dyspnea, extreme cyanosis, and episodes of syncope. Her hemoglobin is 27 grams, and her hematocrit is 82%. Her 
Her fraternal twin sister with a normal heart weighs 56 pounds. The patient weighs just 36 pounds. Her x-ray is typical of severe tetralogy of Fallot. Anemic lung fields, the usual heart silhouette of right ventricular hypertrophy and sparse pulmonary vasculature, and the concave pulmonary artery segment is evident. Because of the frequent similarity between the clinical signs of tetralogy and other forms of cyanotic heart disease, the Minnesota heart surgeons learned it was wise to perform a forward angiogram to confirm the anatomy of the great vessels. This pulmonary artery segment, anterior to the aorta, confirms the diagnosis of tetralogy. In this extracorporeal circulation hookup, the patient is on the left, the sigma motor pump for cross-circulation is in the center, and the disposable bubble oxygenator is on the right. Operations were done under normal thermia. The oxygenator reservoir is immersed in a water bath to control temperature deviations. Venous blood rises in the oxygenator mixing tube, enters the transverse debubbling chamber, and then into the final debubbling in the Helix Reservoir in this 1955 model of the DeWall Lillehei Helix Reservoir Oxygenator. The heart is exposed by a transverse thoracotomy. Stay sutures are placed in the right ventricle for later retraction. Both cavi are being occluded. The patient's head is to your left, feet to the right, and the right atrium is in the foreground. The very hypertrophied right ventricle is opened. Extensive collateral circulation in these cyanotic patients causes rather copious intracardiac blood. However, with the low physiological flows, the surgeon's visibility was much improved during these early operations. The severe infundibular stenosis is excised with a pituitary rongeur. A valvular stenosis also had to be incised. Upon relief of the pulmonic stenosis, Hegar dilators progressively increasing in size enlarge the outflow tract in the severely malformed heart. An unexpected defect, an unruptured aneurysm of the Valsalva sinus, is ligated at its base. Stitches are placed circumferentially around this large VSD. Exposure is improved by tightening the sliding tourniquet around the aorta to produce temporary ischemic arrest. A large patch is fashioned of compressed polyvinyl sponge. 16 mattress stitches are required to encircle this large defect. Once the stitches are placed, the tourniquet is relaxed to restore coronary flow. When stitches are correctly placed, they can be easily tied. The coronary sinus blood flow does not interfere. An early lesson in tetralogy repair was using a patch in the ventricular septum for all these severe tetrads. 
Hypoplasia of the pulmonary outflow tract is such that an outflow roof is needed in addition to relieving the obstruction. A 20 to 1 compressed polyvinyl sponge is sutured into the right ventricular outflow to widen it. Here the young girl is about 12 days post-op. Her improvement is already visible in her good color. At one year, she was recatheterized and had no shunt. There was an insignificant 10 millimeter gradient over the pulmonary outflow tract. Normal hemodynamics, normal oxygen saturation. But the lesson of how these defects materially interfere with physical growth is vivid when she is with her twin sister. The Dewal Lillehei bubble oxygenator was an instant success where it was tried. And the revelation that uh, open heart surgery could be carried out with a few lengths of uh, plastic tubing, some clamps, and some oxygen had an explosive effect on the growth of open heart surgery worldwide. In 1956, a commercially manufactured oxygenator was developed by Gott, DeWall, and Lillehei. This self-contained, unitized plastic sheet oxygenator facilitated open-heart surgery applications. The surgeon's dream of routinely performing intracardiac correction in the open heart had become reality. Epstein's malformation is a severe congenital defect of the heart in which the tricuspid valve is malformed and is positioned downward and displaced along the walls of the right and left ventricle. This seven-year-old patient, cyanotic since birth, had become severely limited in recent years by dyspnea and fatigue. The clubbing in his fingers is marked. Cardiac catheterization confirmed the diagnosis. His arterial saturation, due to a large right to left shunt, is 80% at rest. His hemoglobin is 23 and half grams. The severe cardiomegaly is typical, made up of a greatly enlarged right atrium and the atrialized portion of the right ventricle. The narrow pedicle of his heart, appearing like an inverted funnel, is evident. Pulmonary vasculature is sparse. The catheter occupies this huge right atrium, its tip at the downward location of the tricuspid leaflet remnants. A diagram explains the pathology. The septal leaflet is located nearest to its normal position. The anterior and posterior leaflets are always displaced markedly downward. The coronary sinus remains in a normal position. Like most other congenital lesions, Epstein's malformation has a wide spectrum of severity and significantly shortens life in the majority. Studies indicated that 59% were dead by age 20 and 79% by 30. Heart and great vessels are exposed by a midline sternotomy. The patient's head is to the left, feet to the right. A hugely enlarged atrium is in the foreground.
The exposed interior of the right ventricle reveals abnormal remnants of the tricuspid valve. These are carefully excised. Special attention is paid to the septum, which is very thin in the atrialized portion of the ventricle. The excised remnants have valve structural tissue, but no functional value. Circumferential mattress stitches are placed to create a new annulus at the level of the normal annulus, but deviating the suture line above the coronary sinus. This avoids damage to the important conduction system. The huge right-sided dilatation makes it easy to insert an adult-sized Star Edwards valve in this seven-year-old patient. The already placed mattress stitches are threaded through the valve skirt in the customary fashion. The valve is seated in the newly created annulus. Tying the stitches completes the valve implantation. Although the atrialized portion of the ventricle that remains below the new valve has a very thin wall, histological studies show normal muscle cells in that wall. Evidence indicates that these cells slowly assume the structure approaching a normal right ventricular wall. Returning nine months later for post-operative evaluation and catheterization, the dramatic increase in the patient's vigor and color improvement are evident. At surgery, nothing was done to his patent foramen ovale since it closes naturally as the pressures readjust. Heart size decreased dramatically. Heart catheterization disclosed significantly reduced right atrial and right ventricular pressures. His arterial oxygen saturation improved to 97% compared to 80% saturation preoperatively. This prosthetic valve is in a normal annulus position. A forward angiogram shows a now normal sized right ventricle and good prosthetic valve function. Normal flow through the right heart was achieved. Well, the early uh, research in this field was uh, difficult and uh, in developing these methods of open heart surgery, but there were many failures, frustrations, discouragements but uh, I think we persisted 
And uh, in uh, looking back, uh, that did lead to success in the terms of uh, developing uh, simple and effective uh, methods for repairing these defects inside the heart. And, uh, I certainly would like to be remembered as one that left the field of uh, open heart surgery in a much better condition than uh, we found it in the beginning.